Howdy everyone, what we're going to do today is get into the issues around scale. This is a bit of a difficult topic. There are some solutions and methodologies that are offered in this lecture, but I would not suggest that the entire scaling problem has been practically solved. But we'll go ahead and we'll cover um, a bunch of the fundamental concepts. We'll get into scale. What do we mean by scale? Support size the data, the model. We'll talk about dispersion variance, and then we'll get into how we can scale statistics. All right, to start off here, we'll talk about scale, support size. What's the motivation for this lecture? Well, with reservoir modeling, we are compelled to work with data and models, cells, and so forth, that are all at a wide range of different scales. Every statistic that we calculate, and we do use statistics for the purpose of prediction, has an implicit scale attached to it. And so we need to be cognizant of that. Scale impacts the dispersion, it impacts the spread of the distribution. Therefore, as we talked about in the last set of lectures, that impacts directly the uncertainty model. So let's tell a tale of two different models here. If we were building two different models, one looks like this, the other one looks like this, we would look at them and we would see that they actually are effectively the same model. All that's really changed is the resolution or the scale at which we're modeling. In fact, if you look at it, the local details are very much the same, areas of low, areas of high, and so forth. The only difference is that this has a scale of about a, I believe they're 10 meter by 10 meter cells, while this has a scale of 100 meter by 100 meter. So it's a 10 times scale up to go from here to over here. Now, let me ask you this. I created this fine scale model. I scaled up to this large scale model. Would you expect the statistics to remain the same? Do you expect it to have the same histogram, the same varigram? Well, we don't have to wonder, we can calculate the histogram and the varigram. So we run this test and we go ahead and build the model. We upscaled it 10 times, so 10 time upscaling. And we got to calculate the histogram of the original small scale model and the upscaled model, the varigram of the small scale model and the varigram of the upscaled model. What happened? First of all, the first observation we could make is that the distribution mean did not change. I used arithmetic averaging for each one of the cells, 100 values being upscaled in every one of those cells. There's no reason to believe that that would bias the result. The mean stays the same. 8.4%, 8.4% porosity, it's the same in both models. Did the variance change? We had 3.6 for variance before. Now we have a variance of 3.0. Now, that's interesting. The variance has, in fact, shrunk. Let's go back to the image and see if that makes sense. Just look at the color bar and train your eye on the color bar. The color bar has stayed the same. 3% is dark blue. 13% is a bright red. Look at the map right here. You can see some dark blues. You can see some bright reds. When you come over here, you do not see that anymore. The averaging has caused a regression towards the mean locally. And so we have decreased the variance. That's natural. We'll get into how we can numerically predict that change without having to do the actual upscaling in the first place. And we'll talk about how it occurs. Now, what about the varigram? First of all, if you look at the varigram, I have not normalized or standardized the varigram. And what you can see is the variance has decreased. So the sill has dropped. You see, this was the previous sill for the high resolution. This is the sill now that we have upscaled. If you look at the range, that's interesting too. The range was right about here, around 5,000 or so. And the result here is that the range has increased to about 6,000. So the range has also increased. We have in inflated the spatial continuity in the phenomenon. Okay, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about what we've done, and then we'll talk about how we can predict these changes in the statistics. First of all, we should define what is upscaling. We went from a fine resolution or a high resolution model right here. We went to more of a coarse, low resolution model right here. Subsurface property upscaling 
is an effort to calculate an effective property of interest at a location through aggregating multiple smaller scale measurements. If the porosity averages linearly, and porosity generally does along with saturation, we could simply just average an arithmetic average of all of the measures within this window right here, and we would calculate one value right here. That would be an upscaling. It would be a good value to represent the general tendency or behavior within that square. That would be upscaling, but there's more to upscaling than that. Because what we do in the subsurface is all about modeling. We want to build a model for the purpose of prediction. And so when we upscale, if we were to take this high resolution model right here, a lot of permeability heterogeneity here, permeability, a couple of orders of magnitude, a lot of heterogeneity right here, if I want to upscale and calculate the effective permeability directionally in the x direction over this square right here, I would not just use the arithmetic average. I would be concerned about the general type of upscaling behavior. Now, in the case of permeability, people often will use power law averaging. They can calibrate for a power, and by using that specific power, you get the effective flow, the effective permeability in a specific direction. Now, there are some end members to this. If we're dealing with flow along beds, typically you can take the value within the beds and do the arithmetic average. If you're flowing across the beds, then you will typically take the harmonic average, an omega of negative one. And for other types of flow that are more oblique to the beds, you might be using geometric, which in fact would be omega equal to zero. And there's some pretty lengthy mathematical proofs that show you that in fact the geometric mean is when omega equals zero. It's not apparent from looking at this equation. So what do we learn from that? Upscaling is about building a model such that when we apply the transfer function on the coarser or the large scale, we get the same behavior. That's the whole point. When we do an upscaling in porosity, we expect if we calculate the oil, in, when we calculate the oil in place, we should get the same oil in place between the fine scale and the coarse scale model. Now, of course, it's not always perfect. We do sometimes lose things because that high resolution information can be impactful depending on the transfer function we're using, but upscaling is about making it consistent. Now, how do we deal with upscaling? What are we going to do? Well, we're going to have to adjust our property statistics to account for the change of scale or support size of the information. In fact, when you look at this distribution right here, it's the distribution of the porosity values over the fine scale model, the, the really high resolution model. That histogram has attached to it an implicit scale that's assumed. Every statistic, a mean, a variance, a percentile, a skew or kurtosis, a P13, no matter what it is, they all have a scale attached to them. In fact, we could be in the good habit in subsurface modeling of every time we present a statistic, we could indicate what is the scale, and you remember stationarity, over what area do we use the statistic within the subsurface. And so when we move to this distribution right here, it has a totally different implicit scale. It's working with a finer scale model. My apologies, I do believe I mixed up the cell sizes on the previous slide. The point is that there was a 10 time scale up. Now, what is the missing scale? Many people have heard of the missing scale. The bad news, the missing scale is still missing. What, how would we define it? It's ignoring or ad hoc workflows for scaling from data native support scale, the implicit scale of the data, to the reservoir model cell grid scale and not accounting rigorously for that change in scales. What's the native data support that we're working with? If we have a well log, we're dealing with probably on the order of a cubic meter around that magnitude, because we have a depth of penetration into the rock away from the bore of maybe a meter or two, but we're only measuring over maybe half a foot interval. Excuse my mixing up of meters and feet, but we commonly do use feet when we're talking about downhole measurements and so forth. But in general, well, we'd imagine measurements every sixth of a meter, tenth of a meter, and so forth. So now we're going from that, and if you imagine cores, it's even smaller scale. At a core, we're dealing with the actual extracted core of the rock. It's going to have 
wow, a dimension that maybe is measured best in, if we're taking core plugs, it's definitely going to be cubic centimeters. So these are very small support sizes over which we're making effective property measurements like porosity, permeability. Now we're going to take those values and assign them to a model grid, usually the one that's coheval, coheval with the data, and we'll use the statistics from the data to inform all of the model cells that don't have data in them. Wow, that is a jump in scale. We're going from cubic meters, a few cubic meters, to 50 to 200, to 50 by 200 meter horizontal dimension of a model cell, typically anything from about half a meter, a meter is pretty common, maybe two meters, maybe up to five meters in a very coarse model, typically more like a meter or two. That's a massively different scale at which we're working. The common workflows do not really scale the statistics the way they should. In fact, they're quite ad hoc. Often they'll take the closest data at along the well to the centroid of the model grid cell and just simply paint that value. That's completely ignoring the scale issue. Maybe what they might also do is they might do some type of linear arithmetic averaging or power law averaging along the well bore only. But remember that well bore is only sampling a very small aerial extent of that model cell. And so it's really not fair to assign that value, even if we did the best job we could of upscaling along the well bore, we have not captured the heterogeneity array from the well bore. Now, the one exception is this. If we have extreme spatial continuity, horizontal layering throughout the model cell, and this model cell is aligned with that layering, in fact, we'll find that, that some form of averaging along the well bore will actually become sufficient in that case. But that's commonly not what happens. So let's just step back and think about this concept of changes in statistics with changes of scale. And we can ask ourselves a really basic question. Take these three models with three distinctly different spatial continuity models. Short range, medium range, long range. Put a cell right here and now scale up to an effective property over that cell. Do you think they would all behave exactly the same? Just think about that. I would suggest, in general, if you have low spatial continuity, it will result in a fast regression to the mean, given the fact that we have assumed, if we assume stationarity, there's all kinds of issues with scale up and stationarity, but assuming stationarity, we would expect it to regress to the mean very quickly. Well, you don't have to trust me. I went into Jupyter Notebook and I created in Python a nice little workflow. And so let me go ahead with this workflow and I'll show you this idea of a scale up. We have long range spatial continuity with some geometric anastropy. We have only short scale continuity here. And all I did was I scaled up from model cell sizes of about 100 meters, 200 meters, 500 meters. Just look at the color bar. Same color bar for all of, this, all of the images. It's fractional porosity. And look what's happened we are very quickly regressing to those, is that peach, pink? I don't know what those colors are, but we are getting to them while we still have a lot of yellows and purples here. Clearly we have more variants. Well, purple, yellow, peach was not a very quantitative way to describe what just happened. So let's do it this way. Go ahead and look at the distributions. Original distribution shown here going between about zero and 20% porosity and fractional porosity. And here's the original model. And then when we scale up, look what's happening. We're quickly reducing the variance of the model. Now let's take the short scale continuity model. Notice it had the same distribution. Let's check. It's about the same. I think my graphic moved around, but I think it should be the same distribution. Now look at what's happened. Compare them. As we go up to the 200 meter by 200 meter cell, 500 meter by 500 meter cell, go back and forth. Look at how the distribution variance has reduced so, so quickly. All right, so let's go ahead and make some general observations from what we've seen experimentally. We're not going to do anything analytical at this point. We're not going to describe any relations yet, but we'll do that shortly in the next lecture. In general, as we move between scales, the mean does not change. The variance changes. As we go to a larger size support, we expect the variance to shrink. There may be a shape change, but we will not tackle that here. We will just talk about variance change. 
We will not get into those topics during this lecture. There's more we could talk about. Best practice is to check the shape change empirically. For now, run your scale up, see what it looks like. Is it reasonable? If it's an extreme change in variance, you probably have a change in shape and it's not right to just assume that there's no shape change. We will assume no shape change and so we could use the A fine distribution correction, which we've talked about before, to just scale, which allows us to shift and for us now to change the variance, which we're more concerned about right now. The variance reduction and distribution is adversely proportional to the range of the spatial continuity. That's what we observed is that there's a negative relationship between them. Over common scale changes, this impact may actually be significant. Common scale changes, we already indicated, native data scale to actual model grid cells, we're talking about a really big change in size support, and we need a methodology to be able to predict this. Now, I promise we'll get into more analytical types of approaches to deal with scale change. So in the next lecture, I will talk about dispersion variance. But this lecture was sufficient to describe the problem, to demonstrate it empirically, and now we can get into more mathematics to get to handle it. All right, I hope that was useful to you. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm the Geostat guy on YouTube, GitHub, and Twitter. And I'm always happy to share, and I'm always happy to hear your questions or your ideas. If you have comments about these courses, I'm always I welcome ideas for improvement. All right. I hope this was useful. All right. Take care. Bye.